What's up, my friends? I pray you guys are standing strong in your faith. I appreciate the time you guys are taking to watch this video as we talk about David Platt and unfortunately the problems that are unfolding at McLean Bible Church, which I believe a big reason for that is because of the critical race theory that David Platt and many of the leaders of the church are embracing. And so I want to show you guys five key problems about his standpoint with critical race theory. I believe his intent in so many areas is genuine. He's trying to do the right thing, but there's some errors of his ways, okay? And this is important because if this is going to be happening in your church or is currently happening in your church, you'll be aware of how to respond based on some of these subtleties or interpretations on critical race theory or, oh, okay, that's what that means. So if you see some wokeness, you'll be aware of it. And when you do, again, we show love to people because I do believe the heart of people like David Platt is to unite the body of believers, okay? So let's be praying for the church that they'll resolve this kind of conflict. And let's also pray for our churches that we would not go astray, but that we would stay united as well. So let's jump into the first video here of Platt talking about some of these issues. On a related note, I, I do not want to speak from the Bible on issues that are popular among white followers of Christ while staying silent in the Bible on issues that are important to non-white followers of Christ. That's not faithful pastoring. I actually read this week how studies have shown that white church leaders are less likely to speak and act prophetically on race issues because white church leaders have more to lose when they do. And we cannot truly worship God while we stay silent on injustice in all kinds of areas. And I know as a white pastor, I have blind spots. So I am part of the problem. I need friends and fellow pastors around me from different ethnicities who help me see those blind spots. And I'm, I'm committed to listening and learning and loving, laying aside whatever contemporary church growth methodology says is the best way to grow the church, i.e. ignore the issues. I want us to do the exact opposite. I want us to hear God's word clearly on these issues, and then we can trust him with the growth of his church. So it doesn't seem like what David Platt just said there is wrong. And again, and I wouldn't say that, that so much of what, he, what I just showed you is, is wrong, but there are some subtlety things, you guys. One is he's saying, as a white pastor, I'm a part of the problem. I mean, what does that really mean? When you say, because I'm white, I'm part of the problem. Are you taking blame and responsibility? See, so what happens, you guys, and we have to be careful. And I counsel a lot of pastors, and I talk to them privately about some of these things, in this case, regarding some white pastors who, who, who don't want to be blinded towards some of these things. That's a good thing, okay? But when, if you have a conviction about something, or you are prejudicial about things, or you have been biased, or you haven't made an effort you know, to talk about some of these things because you are afraid to talk about them because you don't want to intimidate people and afraid that people are going to leave as a result of it, then you got to work that stuff out, okay? Maybe that's a separate issue, but don't take some conviction you have or maybe a book that you read and then all of a sudden you start guilt tripping your church into believing the same. Like if I'm white and I believe I'm part of the problem and you're white, you're part of the problem as well. Don't automatically assume that over certain people. Now, here's another concerning video coming from a pastor under David Platt. Totally honest, like, so being angry about the situation, but um, it's difficult for me uh, sometimes not to just torch, like, all white people because, in particularly, white evangelicals and Christians. So, again, this language, it, it, it kind of shows you guys what's really happening. You know, I think Platt is obviously being um, more hospitable, but then this black pastor has a right to talk about torching white evangelicals. I think some of the slang there is just kind of like rip on them or to just lay into them and just show them that they are racist or that they are prejudicial. And I don't think it's like, hopefully it wasn't literally saying he wants to set them on fire. But, but see, that's the problem, you guys. When you start embracing this critical race theory, this is how you start judging the body of Christ. It's very divisive. It's not the way that Jesus Christ handled equality, if you will or how Paul dealt with it in the book of Galatians in Galatians 3, verse 28. So let me jump right in now and point out five problems with David Platt's critical race theory. The first problem is that David Platt believes systemic racism exists in America. You say, well, I do. Jay, I believe in that. Where's the proof? If you want to look at institutions and show institutionally that systemic racism exists. Do you know that the liberal mindset 
the left, if you will, things that run contrary to a biblical worldview, people who are naturalists, they're the ones that are running these institutions on the university level, on the big tech level, on the government level. We as a nation have fought against racism more than any other nation. If there are disparities, that does not mean that white supremacists, and I'm saying this again, you guys, as a guy who's half Mexican, who grew up in a poor neighborhood in Tucson, Arizona, with a bunch of Hispanics and blacks, okay? I grew up in a very diverse background, and I loved every minute of it. It wasn't easy, but I love the culture. I love the different languages, the different foods, the different beliefs, the different creeds, the different ways of how we looked at life. But we didn't even believe that systemic racism existed, okay? Where's the proof of this? But because what you're doing is you're undermining people who have fought relentlessly. I mean, again, we fought a war to end slavery, to equalize blacks and eventually women. We have fought for this stuff. We've made amendments to the Constitution. Churches have repented. There, are there still racist people? There will always be racist people. But it's not to the degree, I believe, that most people like David Platt believe there is because I think what they're doing is they're inciting more problems than solving them. Here's the second problem. David Platt believes the gathering of the church on Sunday is actually the most divided time of the week. That's what he has said from the pulpit. That is false. I mean, where's the hope in this, you guys? Not only are you discrediting what our nation has gone through to fight against racism and still say there's uh, systemic racism and not admitting that other minority groups can be advancing racism. You're just blaming white people. And I'm not fully white, but I'm not embracing that point of view. The other thing is, then you look at the church and you say, well, the church is the most divided area or the most divided time um, in, during the week. It says who? I mean, again, should we have to look at data to back that up? Where's the faith in the power of the Holy Spirit in forgiveness and being one in one faith and one baptism with one Savior, Ephesians chapter 4? See, this is what happens when you buy into these social injustices all the time. You're just always seeing things in the negative. That's a major problem. Problem number three, and again, I'm being very quick on these things, you guys, but I'm just trying to bring these things to your attention, and hopefully you can do more research on them later. Third problem, David Platt believes white pastors are a big part of the problem of racialization. Now, racialization, according to him, is a term that he uses instead of racism because he says the moment you use the term racism, you're put off. Well, David, when you basically attack white people and say you guys are the problem, and you're telling their church that when we gather together, even though we need to be more diversified and we need to do this, we need to do that, we're the most divided you know, time of the week when we gather at church on Sundays, you're not bringing hope to these people because you're buying into critical race theory, which critical race theory, quote, is a practice. It's an approach to grappling with a history of white supremacy that rejects the belief that what's in the past is in the past and that the laws and systems that grow from that past are detached from it. And then the writer goes on to say, those who believe in critical race theory would say that racism and discrimination is an everyday experience for those of color. And guess what? I have blacks and I have Hispanics and other people of, of ethnicity that are not white that will say that they don't experience racism every day. Matter of fact, a lot of them will tell you that I have not really experienced racism in my entire life. So again, this is a false narrative. And using the word racialization to try to modernize this discussion, to bring it into the church to be more subtle so you can indoctrinate them in critical race theory is disappointing. Here's the fourth problem. David Platt believes the, the more Christian you are, the more racist you'll be. He uses, he's, again, he cites data. Not to say that the data is valid, David, but you say that in actual fact, it was the more conservative white Christian who doesn't want to deal with anything related to injustices with other people of different color or to deal with any type of discrimination. Matter of fact, you're saying from this data that they were more discriminatory the more religious they were. Again, 
you say that your church that gathers on Sunday is the most divided time in the week in any part of, of, of the country. Not in games, not in these big stadiums. No, it's the church. What data do you have to prove to show that? And how's that being confident in what Scripture teaches about when we gather together worshiping Jesus Christ? We don't gather together so we could be diverse in our opinions or in color. We gather together not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, to stir up love and good works and honor Christ. And our jobs, David, are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. But then you say the more Christian you are, the more racist you're going to be. And finally, the final problem is that David Platt believes his church needs social issues and critical race theory to interpret theology. So you want to take sociology, sociocultural issues, take economical facts, data from, from our economy, geographical uh, status points, Look at the status quo in these demographics and, and let that interpret our theology of how we are going to fight against social injustices. And that, you guys, are five key problems that I have with what David Platt has been disseminating in his church. And as a result of this, and of course there's other things, but I'm just trying to solidify in bullet point fashion, if you will, so we can understand what is unfolding with critical race theory, not just on the academic level, but how pastors like David Platt have bought into this, some of these things and through his own guilt and shame, okay, he's using this to undermine his position as a pastor to teach the word of God. So hopefully you guys, this helps you guys understand what is happening with critical race theory from the pulpit and why these things are dangerous? Because I think David is trying to resolve some of this conflict. He's trying to address some of these social injustices. But I believe the methodology in, of course, his worldview through critical race theory is not the way to do it. So hopefully, you guys, this has been a blessing to you guys that it's strengthened your faith, given some clarity. If you disagree with me, throw some comments down there, like this video, share this video out there with your friends. If you've never subscribed to my channel, please do so. And I appreciate you guys as your support, your prayers, as we continue to fight the good fight of faith in the culture. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, keep standing strong, my friends.